and Brian, you should have um, screen sharing privileges as co-host as, as well. Very good, thank you. Good morning, Michael. Hello, Veronica. Hi, <laughs> I muted myself. Okay. We have very similar backgrounds. Yeah, I didn't know what background to pick, so I just picked the Collins one. Yeah, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. We're miss, we're, oh, Marissa Robledo. Michael joining in from the office. Fun fact about Marissa, I hope she puts her photo on. Um, in the picture, I have a picture of a group of students outside my office. And somebody thought that was me as a college student. So <laughs> they said, oh, was this taken a while ago? I said, no, that's that's not me. That's Marissa. Okay, take the phone. <laughs> and you've got another doppelganger out there. I'm telling you, every time, well, when I was at trade shows, used to go to trade shows, um, there's a woman that is there. Never introduced myself yet, but she looks just like you. And every time I see her, I'm like, what are you doing? You know, but no, not you. <laughs> Well, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me know. Maybe, maybe I can like, we can I'll like make it a point. Job. I'll make yeah. It. She can outsource her job to me and I can, <laughs> I can half, take in half of that. Good idea. Um, we'll wait just maybe um, one more minute for folks to join us, but um, we're so happy to have everybody here and so honored to have Brian uh, Churchill as our guest speaker to kick off our summer alumni speaker series. So we have a series of these uh, every two weeks throughout the summer, and you will use the same login information that you use today. Um, same password, same link. So if you're looking for it, just uh, refer back to this information. Um, this session will be, is being recorded. Uh, we will have these recordings available throughout the year for our um, students to, to access, um, and as well as for our faculty uh, to use in their classes as, as well. Um, okay, so I know there's a lot going on in the world and um, I just wanted to uh, really just kind of honor that space for, for, for folks right now. Um, for Cal Poly Pomona, uh, you know, justice and, and inclusivity is really important to us and we really want to make sure that for those of you who are experiencing, experiencing any kind of distress, um, for those of us who, who need support to reach out to your friends and family, reach out to us. We're here, we're here to help support you through, through this time um, to, be, to be allies and to stand up um, in, when, when needed. So um, cherish each other and know that we're here to support you and advocate for everybody and respect for, for all people. So thank you very much um, for joining us in, this morning. Um, and I'd like to uh, hand it over to Brian who's gonna get us started. He's going to give a, sm a small presentation and we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, I will help be helping moderate that and you can um, either put your question in the chat or um, during the open discussion time, uh, feel free to turn off your microphone and um, just ask your question as well. So Brian, over Great. Great, well, wow, where to start, where to start? What a crazy, crazy world we're living in right now. Um, I, number one, I'm honored to be here. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to join uh, this session. And I just, a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, I am a man who speaks, but I am not a professional speaker. So please uh, be nice to me. But I do have a lot of information. I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, I do a lot of air quotes, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, but I'm hoping I can keep things relevant and certainly topical uh, with all that's going on. And what I was originally and had put together was sort of a presentation based on our response and our plans uh, surrounding COVID. Um, and obviously the complete disruption it's had on our uh, hospitality industry. Uh, but who knew that we would have yet another uh, uh, sort of hurdle, if you will, or obstacle and even probably more significant. Um, you know, uh, racial justice is just such an important thing and within our hospitality world, even more important. We are such a diverse community in so many different ways. Um, I like to think that it, just been, so I'm gonna be upfront and honest with you on everything I say today, but I, in my world, um, I live it every day. Um, if you think about Los Angeles, there are literally uh, residents from 140 different countries in our city. 
speaking 220 different languages. My boss, African American. My boss's boss, African American. I'm not, but I'm very aware and I'm very colorblind, um, and I try to be on a day-to-day -day basis. But this is this is the world we live in, or happen to live in, or work in in the hospitality world. A very very diverse. Uh, um, cross-section of humanity that makes up Los Angeles Tourism Convention Board, and we celebrate that. Um, Los Angeles is a capital of, of diversity, and as I stated with the uh, residents and the languages spoken. So to, I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen. And, and listen, I don't have a fancy background because I wanted it to be more homey, but I'm going to get into how we're communicating a little bit now more virtually, and I'll show some of our backgrounds in a minute. But um, let me share my screen and let's go from the beginning here can everybody see that okay and is that working all right yeah okay good um so first of all that's me um this is what I saw this morning when I woke up at about 6 a.m. and I don't know if you're familiar with Skift, but Skift is a phenomenal uh, travel marketing um, and, and trade related uh, media source. Um, but right front smack dab in the middle, don't miss this seminal moment for racial justice travel industry. So really just telling us straight up, this has to be a priority for us. And you even just think again about the makeup of our employees or you make up of of uh, those that support us uh, in the industry or those that travel is incredibly diverse. So obviously racial justice is gonna be incredibly important for us. Um, but for the same reasons I mentioned before, it is front and center. We are a city of diversity. We had a campaign, hashtag everyone is welcome, that celebrated that diversity. And I don't know if you've seen any of those promotional materials, but they're phenomenal and that's the whole uh, point is that we are an aspirational global destination open for business to the world, no matter who you are, no matter what your preferences are, no matter what ethnicity, racial, uh, or religious uh, affiliation. So anyway, um, I'm going to weave that in a little bit, but I'm going to retreat just a little bit. I wanted to make sure that also like Anne, give this the right deference it deserves. This is front and center. And as an organization, we're dealing with it as we speak. So I don't have a ton on that, but I do have a ton on COVID and other disruptions and how we're dealing with it. So I'll transition into that now. Um, one of the things we had to do as an organization, when you look at the travel industry at large is um, come up with an immediate plan once we were given the stay-at-home orders, um, once social distancing was mandated, mask wearing, uh, closures of business, and so forth. We had to come up with an immediate plan. So five R's is what I utilized on, the, on my sales team. Our sales team was uh, initially about 25 people uh, globally, representing about 18 different markets, uh, including domestic and, and international. So it's, again, very diverse to use that word, but also uh, expanded the, the globe quite a bit. So what so we have to do is immediately determine how we're gonna handle this new world, this new norm. So we sort of chunked it down into our response, our relationships, we are going to record, not record, but record and research. We're going to reposition and then plan for recovery. One of the things we had to do is keep that in context. Who's the audience? Extern internal and external, and then also domestic and international. What is our messaging and what are we going to be saying to those respective audiences? Um, and then it has to be data driven. As a DMO, we are a destination marketing organization. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but we are contracted by the city of Los Angeles to represent the city of Los Angeles and essentially sell it to increase visitation, which ultimately through a whole series of funding mechanisms funds the city. And I'll get into that a little bit more, but had to be data driven. And we need to be the curator, curator and provider of information, but not necessarily the cure, the creator. We're not always the experts. Um, a lot of folks thinks that it, think it's a DMO or a CVB, you might've heard that term as well, a convention visitor bureau, that we know everything. We know a lot, we know a lot about the city, but we actually have to curate this information um, and be the provider of the information. I'll get into that a little bit more as well. So response is the first uh, of the five R's. Um, just to give you a comparison, because I think so many industries are, are hit so directly by what's going on uh, with, with COVID. So as I said, we're a DMO contracted by the city. 
um, destination marketing organization. We are a $60 million not-for-profit organization and a 501c6. We had about 150 employees, 12 departments, and that's sales, marketing, accounting, uh, business affairs, digital marketing, uh, creative, it goes on and on and on, but 12 departments. We had nine international offices. Now, literally at the flip of a switch, we had to make in two weeks, we had to make a decision to absolutely, you know, retool our organization. And we went from 60 million to about 12 million. We had a $5 million run rate per month. Now we're down to about a million dollars per month. And that's still questionable. Um, we are a 501c6, and I put still there because a 501c6 designation does not qualify us for the uh, payment or payroll protection plan um, or any of the other stimulus that was provided by the U.S. government. If you're a 501c3, you uh, qualify, but unfortunately we didn't. So we were sort of left out hanging as a unique organization that couldn't get any federal funding. Now we're working on that. We're hoping that's going to help uh, in the next couple of months, but that will keep us limping along a little bit. We're down to about 50 employees. Um, about 10 of those are part-time and the rest are indeed full-time with significant pay cuts. Um, we were an international global organization in all senses of the world. We have uh, four offices in China. Um, those most have been shuttered, but we do have some representation there. Um, we have international office throughout continental Europe, United uh, Kingdom, um, also uh, Australia, New Zealand. But now, because of obviously travel restrictions, we are absolutely domestic focused. And one of the other things that we do as a marketing organization is programming. So whether it's trade shows, uh, client events, um, uh, marketing or uh, promotional stunting, um, we have no money to do that anymore. So that's our new world, if you will. Um, what we had to do too is think about, you know, what are we going to do internally versus externally and how we're going to address that, particularly with the LATCB team um, and particularly with other DMOs. What are they doing? What are cities doing? Um, what, what are stakeholders' expectations? What are clients' expectations? Uh, but the first thing turning inward is the sales team. And that's near and dear to my heart because I'm the vice president of hotel sales. So we're really focusing on meetings within our hotel community. Um, and if you look at the second line there for hotel sales, um, here, I'll get the pointer going. For hotel sales, uh, we again went from about 18 to five. Those are full-time directors, plus we had another five uh, support team members. Um, so again, really significant cuts, 70% overall and about 72% for my team. And that was immediate. And you think about, we were an eight-year-old family. We had worked together for eight years. And you think about that loss, and it's really, you know, it's, it's devastating. It's emotional. So we had to deal with that and contend with that as well. Next, if you just think about, we had about 19,000 accounts. Each account, about an average of, uh, you know, two or three contacts per account. We had to somehow distribute all of that base of business that wants to book LA for either a convention or for a, a meeting conference uh, incentive trip um, or, or exhibition, we had to take all of those counts and redistribute them in this small team. And I'm just showing you this slide to give an example. Uh, some folks had to increase their load by 67%, 76%. Um, we, the leadership, had to take on additional responsibilities. So it just gives you kind of an idea of what we're doing there. From an account management perspective, it, we used to focus primarily 50% on proactive sales. And that means literally prospecting, sales trips, doing site inspections, trade shows, what have you. Now, proactive selling is just really not the thing you wanna be doing. You're not gonna get in front of a, a meeting planner. They don't have any impetus to buy right now because they're waiting to see what uh, protocols are gonna be in place for all the meetings and so forth. So now what we're doing is really account management and 65% of our time and even more now is reaching out to those 19,000 accounts and just maintaining a relationship and being consultative and, and showing empathy about what everybody's going through because again, all industries are really feeling it. Um, relationships, the next R. Uh, we had to really take a look at stakeholders and, and clients. Um, if you think about what we are responsible for and who we are working with, this list is just a short list of, of a fraction of who we uh, deal with, but you think about it from a hierarchy of importance, access to the city, once you're at the city, where do you stay, 
um, et cetera, et cetera, and how do you get around and what are you experiencing and so forth. So if you look at um, uh, number one, LAX, you have to get here. And we, in 2019, welcomed 88 million passengers. 95% decline uh, in literally a two week time period. And so now we have a fraction of that type of visitation. So we had to address that. Hotels, we have 165 member hotels with 43,000 rooms. Um, about a uh, little more than 50% initially, um, literally suspended operations. In other words, they had to close down uh, for the sheer fact that there was no demand. Um, you look at our clients, as I discussed, had to reach out to those clients. Many of them, we had over 471 uh, arriving meetings in uh, the next 90 days uh, after uh, stay-at-home orders. Um, we had to address all of those and say, what do you want to do? You want to rebook? Do you want to try to go through with this? Uh, you know, what have you. So we had those 19,000 accounts to contact. Venues and attractions, and, and many of them which are strategic, strategic Partners rely on us to drive business to them. So we had to, uh, again, uh, maintain those relationships. Um, customer advisory board, um, they are a very select few, about 20, that are on a customer advisory board that help us as a steering committee to guide us and what is relevant, what is current, and what is really a most tantamount of importance for them. Um, so we reached out to them and got their input. What do we do? Uh, we are a membership-driven organization, 1,100 restaurants, suppliers, et cetera. So we had to reach out to them. Funding channels, tourism marketing district, um, which is a promotional uh, funding uh, mechanism for marketing the city, transit occupancy tax or TOT, LAWA, which is Los Angeles World Airports, and as I said, membership. Those are our funding channels. We had to make sure we are maintaining those and what does the new norm look like. Business affairs, uh, city officials, partner cities, what are they doing? Santa Monica, uh, Pasadena, West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, they are their own cities, but we represent them as well. What are they doing in this situation and how can we help? And then vendor partners, our own suppliers, uh, trade, media relationships, and so forth. So there was a lot to manage. And you think about that at just a flip of a switch. And I know all of your lives were disrupted too. And you think about all the things that you had to consider, we were in that same same boat. So the next R um, is uh, record and research, and it's not like breaking a record, but just literally recording all the data that we possibly could. Uh, process, procedures, and data. Um, I'm personally really big on data-driven decisions. Keep the emotion out of it, let's make a data uh, based decision. And so that's really what we tried to do too, is, is as soon as we were faced with this uh, condition, let's get as much data as we possibly can. And, and the resources are infinite. Um, so uh, data collection, but LA specific, there was so much macro data about global impact of the economy and then domestic impact from a US perspective, but we really didn't have a lot of data specific to Los Angeles. So we really had to do a lot of data collection as that, as that was uh, more micro than macro. Um, cancellation and rebooks, and I said we had you know, over 400 arrivals in the next 90 days after stay at home orders. What do we do with all these people? So we had to manage that. That was probably the most you know, overwhelming process is determining what hotels they're intending to arrive, what does that hotel want to do, then there's a whole contract component with force majeure. I'm not sure if you guys have gotten into that in the classroom setting yet, but um, tons of things that need to be considered there. Um, production expectations as well, particularly from a sales perspective. What, what do we expect our salespeople to be selling and how much? Um, and so what are those production expectations, expectations, trending, current, and also historic? And we do have some references to some of other economic downturns, so we were able to take a look at that. Hotel closures, I'll get in a little more detail. Uh, staff reductions, so it wasn't just our staff reductions that we had to deal with, but it was those that we worked very closely with and the contacts that we had long-term relationships with that had been laid off or furloughed and no longer could be uh, reachable. A difficult situation, obviously, for all of us. Um, consumer sentiments. Uh, what is the real propensity to consume from a meeting planner perspective or, for that matter, uh, a visitor? Do they want to come to Los Angeles? highly unlikely. Is anybody doing travel? No, we're all stay at home orders. So, you know, what is the real pro propensity to consume and when will that return? Um, industry related data, ton of it, obviously. When we have uh, meeting, um, 
sorry, uh, yeah, Meeting Database Institute uh, out of Chicago. They have been dynamite, MDI, but there are so many other tra trade and field uh, related research that we can do. Health and safety protocols, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but CDC, state, county, and city, I'm not sure how much of that you've been reviewing also in the classroom setting, but it just goes on and on and on. And so what we were trying to do is come up with a simple message to share with our hotel stakeholders and our meeting planning stakeholders and also any visitors. When is it gonna be safe? What are our health and safety protocols? And what is the, the new norm going to be look like from an experiential perspective when you're visiting Los Angeles? So this is just a short list. Um, if you look at academia, uh, Johns Hopkins University had one of the best, and it's, it's right here, but one of the best live uh, um, representations of what's going on from a COVID perspective. But you've got the feds with CDC, California government, their Department of Public Health, LA County, a city of LA follows the county, doesn't have their own Department of Health, um, Public Health. Media, LA Times has done a great job sort of curating and consolidating and really distilling all of this information. So you have sort of one point to go to to learn about what's happening with COVID then, now, and in the future. And then national DMOs, our brand USA is really kind of the marketing arm for the, the, the country, if you will, versus us as a marketing arm for the city of Los Angeles. They have some great data. And then Destination International, which is a DMO association or association of destinations, um, they have a ton of data. So it just kind of goes on and on and on. But we had so many resources, just a matter of distilling it, making it relevant. One of the things we did there was health and safety protocols in the field um, and this hotel surveys, we literally called our hotel partners, five brands, five different plans, um, Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott, Omni and Intercontinental literally all had different plans, very similar uh, because they have to follow a CDC guidelines, but um, uh, amazing how everybody had a different, different plan. So we dug a little deeper um, and we look at health and then I don't expect you to read this. I know it's small, but the point is, if you went out and looked for information, there were 16 resources right here that all had similar information and so identical, but all a little bit different. And that resource, I also use Skift for that. But the other thing was just in the travel industry, there were 17 different resources, all sort of saying slightly different things. And whether it's media or other destinations or other associations, just a ton of information that we had to sort of navigate through and determine what was really relevant. So after that, repositioning. Um, and this is the fourth of the five R's. We as an organization had to reposition. What are our short and long-term cost containment needs? Um, what sector, sector strength from a, a demand perspective? And then what is the new norm? And these are all answers, no, I mean, I'm sorry, all questions that nobody really had answers for. Um, and, and we had all the stakeholders that I mentioned before were looking to us for the answers. So we're in a position to try to determine well, we're not the experts. Like I said, we're sort of the creator, uh, I, I'm sorry, we're the provider and the curator of information, but not necessarily creators. So we had to look inward. What was our new mission? Short-term, long-term, international, domestic. Um, stakeholder priorities. How can we be the most helpful and relevant? Um, cost containment so that we can remain solvent as an organization and still provide all the services and input and guidance that we currently do with all of our stakeholders. Programming, as I kind of mentioned before, trade show missions, client events, and fans, which were really one of our number one priorities, have now been cut entirely. So we have to really think about, wow, what's that new norm? How are we gonna get our message out as it pertains to the city of Los Angeles? So the next is messaging. And obviously, and as is every other industry, we have to go the virtual platform. And here we are today, a virtual platform. And so all of our sales calls, and I'll get into a little bit more detail, but our sales calls, our virtual site inspections and so forth are all now online. Um, but the new norm is still evolving in that messaging, uh, particularly when it was sort of post COVID messaging. But now we really need to look at, again, this sort of uh, racial justice messaging and how do we position ourselves as a, as a city with sensitivity, but also uh, you know, with empathy, empathy and authenticity. Um, and that's difficult. It's a tough road to, 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 to walk. 
Um, economy uh, and, and travel sentiment still now even more, I think, mysterious. The one good thing is domestically we have a ton of strength and California as a state is one of the states that can actually be somewhat self-sustaining based on its own uh, local travel, um, if you will, or regional travel, which is really unique to our state. Now it won't reach 2019 record levels, but it can self-sustain based on our own 40 million uh, uh, residents. So that's encouraging, at least for California, not to mention that it's still a West Coast aspirational destination and everybody wants to come here. So that's good news. Real quickly, just some quick examples about the virtual messaging. So this is our uh, portal, if you will, for video conferencing and, and virtual selling. And just a screenshot of what we were doing. If you look here, this is downtown. It's a virtual a site inspection, and this is one of our convention sales directors and our VP of convention sales, but that's the new norm. <clears throat> Virtual site inspections. We have an online platform that allows you to literally navigate throughout the all regions, five regions of Los Angeles, 467 square miles. You can literally do a virtual site inspection in all of our major partners um, and, and regions and hotels, and so that's really been a great technology. We were fortunate enough to have this in place already because we're, you know, production capital of the world, if you will, if you associate us with Hollywood. So we had the ability to uh, really turn this on almost immediately, make a few tweaks, make it a little bit more digestible, and now it's just a fantastic tool for us. Um, and in fact, so good that we were able to get a little bit of press uh, this week in Los Angeles from BizBash. Um, LA Tourism's resource for planners, and that's essentially uh, just emphasizing the B2B <clears throat> opportunities from a virtual perspective. Um, communications, we talked about a bit um, with uh, 19,000 accounts uh, to 24,000 contacts on April 16th. We had to come up with you know, quick messaging, and this is a bi-weekly uh, newsletter, but also it, it has to be educational, it has to be informative, and so really, you know, showing sensitivity about what type of messaging you're sending and how does it impact a meeting planner specifically whose livelihoods have been turned on their ear, but that's also what we've been doing. Um, and then the final, and I hope I'm doing okay with time, we're probably okay, um, the final R is recovery, and, you know, all about speed to market. Um, you know, regardless of the sort of humanitarian elements, there is a fact that we are a business. And so we are competitive. Uh, we want people to visit us more than they do San Francisco or more than they do San Diego or more than they do Paris or London or Macau or whatever it might be. And so there is always a sense of competition as well. So this speed to market question also though is tempered by sort of your messaging and the inflection points in, in the messaging. And what I mean by that is when is the right time? Um, inflection, if you will. So right now we don't wanna say, come visit Los Angeles, everything's great, it's the best city in the world. It's not gonna resonate. We have to really show sensitivity and that's what the marketing folks are doing right now. And they're really the ones that have that expertise or communication, PR, marketing teams putting together that messaging so that when the time is right, we do have a good positioning and we have, we're have we quick to market. Um, well, I added this when legal and possible and appropriate because within force majeure, it's always if illegal and impossible, I'm gonna cancel my meeting or I'm gonna cancel my trip or I'll, I'll cancel that experience. So we have to wait, when is it truly gonna be legal and possible? And that's why we're waiting for the phasing of the reopening of the city as dictated by the governor uh, and, and uh, the county and the mayor. Um, so just some ideas there. <clears throat> One of the things that's important is we have to be real, realistic for this bridge to recovery. Um, it, it, the Stockdale paradox, and I, I, he's a joke, oh God, I can't remember his rank, but anyway, uh, really unfortunate circumstances, but a very smart man in Vietnam. And he, came up with this Stockdale paradox, and I think it just really resonates. You must never confuse the faith that you will prevail in the end with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. And I know it's a little heavy, but the fact of the matter is, is the next bullet point, optimism versus positivity. You can't just say, oh, this just happens for a reason. It'll all blow over. That's positivity, but that's not reality. Optimism, optimism can be reality-based. Like I'm encouraged personally, 
I thought that we'd see a little bit more of a resurgence in Q4, but now fact-based data is telling me it's probably going to be Q1 of uh, 2021. Not the news I wanted to hear, hear, but at least optimistically, I can say Q1 looks good. But it's not just happening for a reason. I don't want to put people out of work and waiting in lines for food and all that because it happens for a reason. That kind of stuff doesn't resonate well with a customer and it definitely doesn't resonate well with your B2B uh, partners. So we really focused on making sure that we're realistic. Um, advocacy. We want to be a catalyst of change uh, with disruption. Uh, comes innovation. And so there is no more disruption, at least in my lifetime, that I can recall than what we're going through right now. So now is an opportunity to really be innovative and be a catalyst of change. And I, I kid you not, I know there's a lot of negativity, but I've never felt more energized. I have more responsibility now, as I think we all do on this call, to make positive change. And so there's a real opportunity here. Data-driven, as I said, speed to market, as I said, and then also geo-focused, but sector-focused. What sectors are going to return? And I'll get into that in a little bit as well. Um, so here's the current state, and this is a little bit of the reality that I was reluctant to share, but I think we all have to realize that if you're graduating and looking for a job or you might have already lost your job or what have you, we have a lot to contend with. There's no doubt about it, and I'll talk a bit more about that as well, but hotel closures, over 50% of the hotels in LA are currently closed, and the ones that are open it, it is illegal or prohibited to do business for leisure or with leisure travelers or, or non-essential. But if you have essential uh, customers, frontline, what have you, um, some are running in the 30 or 40 percent occupancy range, which can keep them limping along. But the rest are literally just closed until further notice. So it's been difficult for Los Angeles. Uh, hospitality industry is one of the most impacted sectors. Obviously, 51 percent unemployment. That's L.A. County. That's crazy when you think about it from an in industry perspective, and it's a sad reality. Uh, projected loss, 53% in direct spend or direct visitor spending, that's $13 billion for LA County. I don't know if you noticed on the first slide, but we're at about a 36 billion in 2018, um, but $13 billion is a ton. Um, projected loss of nearly a billion from LA County uh, tax revenues, and that's general fund. And this is where I always kind of say the nobility of tourism. Um, it, yes, it's all about experiences and that type of thing, but it's also about job creation and the general fund. And that's creating jobs for firefighters, policemen, uh, street cleaners, whatever it might be, but the support of our, our city. And so that's obviously a huge loss of nearly a billion dollars in a city that already has deficit situation from a budget perspective. Um, economic impact, travel industry impact will be nine times greater than that of 9-11. And many of you may not be that familiar with 9-11, but you know, that was rough. And we, at that time, we were saying, we'll never travel again, we'll never fly in an airplane again. But that changed and we saw record breaking demand in 2019. So I know better this round that yes, we will travel again, but unfortunately it's gonna take a little longer. Tourism economics, which I'll go through in a bit, and after I get a time check with Ann here, I wanna make sure I'm not talking too much. Um, tourism economics, which is a resource for us, forecast recovery to be three and a half years to return to 2019 levels. Um, most formulas are 2X recoveries, so if it takes you six months to decline, it'll take you one year or two times six months to get out of that decline, not in this particular situation. So it's gonna be very, very severe. Um, let me check. And am I doing okay from a timing perspective? Yeah, you're you're doing you're doing good. Maybe about another two three minutes, and then okay. we can open up for discussion. Very good, very good. Well, and this is the last of it, so I'll rip through it pretty quickly. But um, the the next thing is this is the tour tourism economics data, and I apologize, the slide might be a little hard to read, but basically what we're saying here is. Um, destination recovery and performance will be reliant on a source market mix. And if you go to this bottom uh, quadrant here, Los Angeles, we have very strong transit share. In other words, we have individual travel demand. That's fantastic. But one of the things is we don't have much domestic share. So we're going to have to rebuild that. And that's because we are a West Coast gateway destination. So we have all the Asia Pac demand. Well, that Asia Pac demand has gone away, and particularly in China, and now with travel restrictions. So we've got that working against us, unfortunately. Um, if you look at these recovery graphs, 
demand during recessions and ADR during recessions. Um, back in 91, 92, uh, that was really a financial crisis, but also exacerbated in LA by the LA riots. Um, and we saw a three and a half percent decline um, uh, in, in room night demand, but it only took six, six quarters to recover and seven quarters is, is the average. Um, for this, uh, I'm sorry, for 03, 02, 03, uh, we saw a 7% decline and it was nine quarters to back to normal. Um, in 09, the, the Great Recession, if you will, or 08, 09, we saw nearly a 10% decline. It took seven quarters. Um, but now they're suggesting it's going to be at least 14 quarters, which is the three and a half years. So um, really, again, working against us a bit. So this is the new norm and an opportunity for innovation. Um, here's the 14 quarters, if you will. You see this significant decline and then the recovery out into uh, 2023. Um, and the reason why I'm sharing this is because this is uh, third party data. This isn't us telling you what's going to happen. This is third party data from the experts and tourism economic is a economics is a trusted resource. So they tell us what our expectation should be. Um, another uh, sort of uh, reference here of um, demand and how it's going to recover back to the 2019 levels here. And so again, if you look at the out months, um, how that's going to transition. It's going to take some time and we're going to definitely for the first year going to really require some patience. <clears throat> uh, anatomy of a recovery. Um, this is again sort of aligned with the phasing of our reopening that is more uh, health safety related, but this is just again based on economic trends um, uh, based on previous uh, crisis. And initial recovery is gonna be leisure. We independently and our families uh, are gonna be traveling and we, we have pent up demand. And in fact, if you look at online uh, searches, there is a ton of pent up demand. And I will also say, fortunately, coastal cities, West Coast, we're seeing a ton of online uh, searching. So all that has to do is come to fruition and, and you know, not just be a, a click, but an actual conversion. And we'll start seeing some visitation from a leisure perspective, and especially from drive markets. So 100 mile range in particular, and there is a lot to do in LA and a lot of people within 100 miles. So we should be in pretty good shape with that regard for this initial recovery. Secondarily, uh, essential business which we've already seen some uh, small and medium sized groups, which is my world. And we're really hoping to see an acceleration of that. Um, and then regional, international, intra America and intra Europe. So the EU will see their own intra travel and so will the Americas and that's that domestic travel. California fares very well from a domestic perspective. Um, and then uh, uh, for, from a US perspective, we have great demand as well. And then the final recovery is long haul which incrementally was the success of Los Angeles because they stay longer and spend more. And so you have more of an economic impact from those long haul travelers. Um, and also from a large event perspective, our conventions, if you will, that creates compression for all of our hotel inventory. So we really need those large events to uh, return. I'm gonna go straight to sectors here. I just wanted to share real quick sector strength We'll be focusing on healthcare, technology, um, and consumer uh, staples. Um, those industries are really coming back strong. Um, and obviously, for obvious reason, those industries are critical during a health crisis. So we're seeing a ton of demand in that regard, and particularly at Q1 of 2021 and beyond. Um, one of the things is to, within the optimism, fact-based, we do have a bright future. Los Angeles, as I said, aspirational destination, and now the host with SoFi Stadium of so many great sporting events coming up. So I just wanted to share that with you because that gives us you know, a horizon and a positive outlook for the next several years or decade, I should say, all the way up to and culminating 2028 with the Summer Olympics. And I've been working closely with them and believe it or not, they're right now in the accommodation securing phase where they're securing accommodations for uh, uh, 2028. So we do have, a lot of positivity in the future. So I know that was a lot. Wanted to give you some context about what we're doing uh, as an organization, but also specifically to LA. So happy to take any questions, Anne. Yes, thank you. That was amazing and great data. Thank you um, for, for sharing. Um, exactly. We are open to questions uh, via the chat box, or you can unmute yourself and ask Brian anything that you might have on your mind. 
Brian, do you want to maybe whilst people are formulating their questions, do you want to briefly talk about what year you graduated from Collins College? And yes, I'm much older than I look. No, I'm just gonna add 1988. Went straight to Marriott, the ID program, which is now Explorer. Um, did six months of uh, intensive training, which was just amazing. All departments in Anaheim Marriott, which is still there, and uh, had just a great start with Marriott long career with Marriott. And then as you begin to sort of become a commodity within the industry, you know, people start tapping you on the shoulder for other jobs, as we say. And so um, I had a few opportunities pop up and bounced around in various other uh, brands, Starwood when it exists, uh, Hilton as well. And then about eight years ago, I um, got tapped on the shoulder for this job and have absolutely loved it. It's been so much fun representing a, a city and being able to stay close with my hotel friends and family, if you will. But that's kind of in a nutshell. Thank you. Barbara Jean, anything from Atlanta? Uh, right now, it's a mess. <laughs> uh, from the restaurant perspective, I mean, literally, right now, it's a mess. And so before the recent events, you know, things were starting to open, you know, and it was looking really positive. So, um, Brian, that was a great presentation. I took a lot of notes. I'm glad this is recorded so I can watch it again. Good. Um, but the data was really wonderful. Good, good, good. Well, I'm happy to provide uh, the, the deck as well if you want me to send it to you, Anne, and you can Oh, share. sure. Yes, yeah, we have everyone's email who registered for today's session, so we can send it out. Very good. Awesome. What questions do you do you all have uh, for Brian? And I have a question for Brian. Yes. Brian, Brian, this is Eddie. Great job on the Thank presentation. You. I enjoyed it. What do you think the impact is on uh, brand loyalty uh, to the hotels who are opening up their properties to the homeless? Yeah, heard, a couple of weeks ago, I heard two around me in Rosemead and um, Monterey Park opened up their 140 room hotel exclusively to the homeless. And um, are they expecting um, future sales from it? Is it a brand loyalty um, strategy or what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, great question. Um, and I think it sort of runs the gamut. Um, I know owner uh, influence had a lot to do with it as well in their positioning. Some owners, and I guess, you know, depending on their, their positioning on that, uh, you know, the issue of homelessness or houselessness, um, they were very eager to help. Um, with the city and the city reached out and was looking for uh, partners. Um, and so I guess dependent on their positioning, they were either embracing it or, or not. Now, from a brand loyalty perspective, you know, once again, th there was some, God, it's, it's just, it's, it's hard to even sort of articulate in the sense that there was so much sensitivity about what our own convention center was doing in the way of accommodating homeless, but even COVID recovery patients. And that sensitivity, I think, initially is sort of in your face. And you're like, wow, I don't know. I don't know if I like that. I'm not sure if I can, you know, embrace that. But as it begins to wane and reality hits and you see the necessity and how it's impacting humanity, then people's, uh, you know, sort of perceptions and behavior changes. So I see that happening also with our hotels. Now, I will also say in the hotel's defense, they really tried to keep it under the radar as much as possible so that there wasn't that negative connotation. Well, I'm never staying in a hotel that accommodated, uh, you know, homeless. Um, but there are others that are like, wow, good on you. Fantastic, uh, you know, humanitarian move to help the homeless. So I know I'm all over the board, but I, I don't think I can predict how, you know, a, a loyal traveler is going to react to that brand's decision uh, to accommodate homeless in a, in, a, in a crisis situation. Um, hopefully, they see it as a good thing. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we have a question from Emily uh, in the chat. She says, since LA is experiencing a loss of demand with the Asia sector, do you plan on targeting different market groups in order to recover? Yeah, without a doubt. And again, I think as I kind of alluded to initially, it is just going to be domestic, domestic, domestic. And, and that is as we see this recovery curve, um, domestic travel return, uh, local, regional, national. Um, so we'll be focusing on that. I think 
what, what's sort of critical for us from an economic perspective is we have a finite inventory and the demand what we were doing was actually displacing some of that demand with our international travelers because once again from a competitive perspective they were spending more money staying longer impacting us economically greater than that of a domestic traveler so now with all of that available inventory if you will and no longer having that asia pacific demand we will replace it with domestic travelers but at a lower rate adr revpar what have you so it'll have an economic impact just based on the uh, travel traveler profile. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank Good you. morning. Good morning, Brian. Thank you for the great presentation, Casey. Thank you. And one. Uh, ownership changes, reflagging of hotels, and even closures. Are there any facts on that yet? And of course, that's going to affect your future planning and business, and, and then even more later in the future openings for the Olympics, as exciting as that is. You know, what are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, there's about a 50% closure rate currently. Um, and again, based on the different situations, whether they're housing essential travel, they're opening and kind of limping along. Um, if they were not accommodating essential travel travelers or um, homeless for that matter and part of that program, um, they are waiting until they are given the okay um, when it is no longer prohibited prohibited to accommodate um, non-essential travelers. So um, right now, 50%, but you see the eagerness. Um, in, in fact, I don't know if, if you had heard anything from Bridget Belinsky or, or Javier Cano, who Javier Cano, ironically, is our chairman of the board for the Tourism Marketing District for Los Angeles, but he's also uh, obviously the head of the JW Marriott downtown where, where Hospitality Uncorked is. So he gives real clear um, uh, direction, if you will. And I think there was a lot of optimism that we would see July, August recovery. But now, even based on the furloughs that Marriott has extended until October 2nd, we're really just putting all our bets on Q4 uh, uh, for this year and really into Q1 of next year. So it's a matter of how we manage through that. But um, ownership changes are always a reality. Um, we have, uh, you know, international ownership downtown, uh, we have domestic ownership, so that will definitely change. Um, I know there's opportunities now in a depressed environment for those that are cash rich to, uh, to acquire hotels, so we're seeing some of that, but not a lot right now. I mean, it's pretty much flattened out. I have a question in the chat from Drake. Um, we're going to rephrase just a little bit, but uh, about the impact of homelessness uh, on travel to the Los Angeles market. Yeah, so, you know, personally, I, I am never going to sweep it under the rug. This is a front and center, in your face issue that all major cities in the US need to address, um, and particularly Los Angeles. And we know the reasons why we have such troubles here, but I was a proud voter of the, the, the uh, Triple H um, initiative. I, I want funds to go towards addressing homelessness and so forth. Um, with that being said, though, when you look at travelers' sentiments, it's way down on a list of a barrier to visit Los Angeles. So we are, of course, relieved to hear that. But the fact of the matter is, is there should be no relief in hearing that because we have a situation in our backyard that we have to deal with. So we grapple with that daily. But again, from a propensity to consume or from a visitation perspective, it doesn't even reach the top 10 reasons that they don't like Los Angeles. What's, what's funny is we still get smog, which is smog has been so much better in so many years, and of course traffic. Um, and so those are really the top two. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we'll take maybe about two more questions before we, we close. All right. I'm gonna. I'll change my background to show you all the backgrounds. <laughs> if I'm a, if I, I see a lot of uh, current students on here that are either graduating this year or in the next two years, what kind of advice? I mean, the numbers you showed us were pretty dismal as far as um, you know recovery for in the hotel market. So if I'm a student graduating the next year to two years and I want to join a hotel company, what advice can you give me to help stand out or yeah. join? Yeah, you know, toughest question. And ironically, I was on another similar call with a competing university, so they'll remain nameless, but I had the same question. And it, it is 
there is no easy answer. I, I hate using the term, but it's unprecedented, right? This is all unprecedented. So even for an old guy like me, I haven't been through this. I've seen some blips here and there, but I've never been laid off. I've never had to go through that before. I've been fortunate enough to be in circumstances or in marketplaces where we had just enough strength to, to limp along as a hotel. So I hadn't, I have not been faced with this and I'll be the first one to admit it. But one of the things I think that we have to be prepared for is that if this industry right now is not strong enough to provide you an employment opportunity, you take all that great knowledge and all of that great education that you have and you build a bridge to get back into this industry. And there are so many resources. There's this one right here. It's called, uh, or hashtag hiring now. I don't know if you can see that, but it's uh, uh, on LinkedIn. And there's literally as of today, I mean, there's at least a, a million jobs out there, 300,000 uh, in our backyard. But that was as of COVID only. With now this additional disruption, I don't, I don't really know what to say. But you're going to have to be resourceful. And, you know, we, we always say, and we still say, we can hire personality and you can train the rest. So it really is coming in there you know, with, with uh, you know, fire in the belly, if you will, and a willingness to commit um, and, and a gregarious attitude and, you know, the, the ability to um, really contribute and show that passion. Um, that's what we look for when we're hiring. And that's what I look for when I hired throughout my entire hotel career. And then we can train the, we can train the basics. Um, that's, that's not the problem. So, you know, again, if, if initially you're faced with the hurdle of potentially not having jobs, then build that bridge until those jobs return. Um, I think, however, though, as I said before, disruption uh, breeds innovation. There is an opportunity to get in this virtual uh, space. Um, virtual meetings right now, in fact, there's so much demand from a production perspective, uh, logistics, audiovisual, what have you. It may not be the customary things you were thinking about doing, but there, there, there are some opportunities. And then I'm hoping, you know, we're seeing the recovery. I mean, obviously, yes, it's a mess for now non-COVID reasons, but the, the restaurant industry should return very quickly. I think they're much more nimble than the travel industry, if you will. So hopefully we'll see some recovery once we simmer down from our current challenges. I hope that's helpful. I know I just don't have any answers. It's really a tough question. So we have our last two questions. Uh, the first, which would be um, with lots of major retail stores filing for chapter 11, What's your um, prediction for hotels that might not open at all after the shutdown or chains that might that might be shut down? The the retail chain shut down and so therefore uh, reducing corporate demand. Um, I think just you know with, with so many places going out of business for COVID, what impact might that have on hotels? Yeah, I you know it. There's lead measures and there's lag measures, and we're really trying to determine the lead measure lead measures of the economic impact on hotels. Um, and none of that has really been disclosed uh, in, in, in total. So I wish I had, again, another clearer answer for that. Um, but as it stands right now, I mean, as of today, and, and again, this is notwithstanding the last several days of, of unrest, um, no one has told us that they're going to be chapter 11 or closing. Um, there is still a ton of optimism and they have plans, procedures, and funding in place to reopen as soon as is, is allowed from a reopening phasing perspective from CDC and, and county and city. All right, thank you. And our last question is, how do you plan to compete with San Francisco and San Diego and other major California cities for limited domestic travel? Wow, well. <laughs> That That's a whole nother hour long. Yeah, it, it, it is. <laughs> but it's, it's a really great question because I will tell you also, look, we're going to have a little bit more of a fallout. We have something like 50,000 plus COVID cases cumulatively. Um, and San Francisco and, and San Diego really don't have that type of caseload as well as Anaheim. So if we are a little bit behind the curve in our recovery, that might just be a reality we're going to have to face. However, even we know our spot and from a hierarchy of demand, San Diego and San Francisco, and Las Vegas really do outperform us from a visitation perspective. So we need them to fill first 
It's we need them to be compressed. We need them to fill so that we can take advantage of that. So we all work together and particularly as a destination, uh, California, Visit California, their DMO, we all work very closely together. So we're okay with them getting business, but I will tell you, Los Angeles still, entertainment capital of the world. You can do more here in the 467 square miles than you can in any one of those other cities. We don't like to talk disparagingly, but that is the absolute reality. There's just more to do here and easier air access. Um, so, you know, once once air is, domestic air uh, is, is back online, we're going to be in really good shape. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate your participation and enthusiasm, and um, we have little clapping hands uh, for, for you. Uh, <laughs> thank so, you. Appreciate thank it, you. guys. Thank you so much. Uh, we, uh, we will see everyone in two weeks uh, for, our, for our next speaker. Again, same login information, and have a wonderful uh, week. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Be safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you.